Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, before I dive into how to forecast where and predict failures of conveyors, I thought I'd give a little background on like what do these conveyors actually look like and why do we care enough about them that we want to predict their failure. Um, so these are some iron ore overland conveyor belts on a mine in the Pilbara. Uh, and pretty much once the ore has been crushed, which is what you can see in the bottom left, that big pit, uh, they're the main method of transporting the ore around the mine site. Uh, and also what you can see in these images is these are long conveyor belts. And they're also very expensive. Uh, and so because of those two facts, there's not a lot of redundancy uh, in the system. And so if one of these conveyor belts fails during a planned period of operation, all production stops in that part of the mine. Uh, so engineers want to try their hardest to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so they have kind of planned maintenance periods, usually uh, six to eight weeks apart. And they try and decide whether or not to change a belt in that period of time. Um, but they have to argue their case because there's other components that need to be changed in that time. So they have to have a justified reason for why that belt must be replaced in that particular shutdown of the mine site. And one of the most critical components on the conveyor is the actual belt itself, uh, which you can see in the right two images. Uh, it's also, it's long, it costs a lot of money and it also incurs a great amount of downtime. So if it fails unexpectedly, there's a lot of lost production because of that. Uh, so engineers try really hard to monitor the condition of the belt to ensure that they don't have any unplanned failures. Uh, but before I get into how they do that, uh, I'll just give a quick outline of what I'll talk about. Um, so first, like what does condition monitoring for a, a belt look like? Uh, and then how do engineers use that data to make their decision currently? Um, and then how have we framed that problem differently and what's our solution? Uh, and I'll go into the specifics of that. Uh, so we're using a Bayesian hierarchical model um, and we're interpreting the data functionally, um, which I'll talk about later. Uh, and then we're modeling the degradation process of the belt using what's called a gamma process. Uh, and then also because we're using a Bayesian method, um, I'll talk about our priors and the justifications behind them. Uh, and then we'll look at the model fit and what predictions actually look like uh, and how well the predictions perform. Uh, and then finally, uh, how does an engineer actually go about making a maintenance decision based on this new forecast? Uh, and then to end, I'll talk about uh, where we plan to put this model in the future. Uh, and at the moment, it's a first approach to modeling beltware. Um, so there are many other ways of doing it. And we've just, uh, we're testing this particular one at the moment and it seems to be doing a relatively good job. So uh, this is a cross section of the conveyor belt. Um, so the belt, the structural component of the belt is called the carcass. It's usually made up of steel cords that you can see here. Uh, and then this carcass is sandwiched between two layers of rubber, which protect it uh, on the top side from ore and on the bottom side from other components. Uh, and the top side generally wears the most aggressively. Uh, and so to ensure that the belt or the carcass is protected from the ore, engineers monitor the thickness of this top coat uh, to ensure that it doesn't get too low and the belt doesn't get exposed to risk of being damaged. And the way that they do this, uh, this is my very technical drawing. Um, up here, we can see an overland conveyor belt schematic. Uh, it's transporting ore from left to right. Uh, so what happens is they stop the conveyor belt and then at the head pulley, at the head of the conveyor belt, which you can see in three dimensions here, uh, they take ultrasonic thickness measurements across the width of the belt. Uh, and then at N locations, and depending on the width of the belt, this can be different. Um, and then they enter that data into a maintenance management software like PDS, uh, where they perform analysis. Uh, and then an engineer will go into PDS and they can look at all the historic measurements. Uh, and this is kind of generally what they'll see. Uh, so on the horizontal axis, uh, we have the wear in millimeters, um, sorry, on the vertical axis. And then on the horizontal axis, we have the measurement location across the belt. So there's 20 measurement locations for this particular belt. And then what we can see is that over time, uh, the belt, so in week one, it starts fairly flat. Uh, and then over time, it wears out into this kind of dished V shape uh, by week 14. Uh, and engineers will assign what's called a soft failure threshold, um, which is beyond a certain point, there's too great a risk of it being damaged. So kind of like what we were just talking about at the end of Tim's presentation, um, 
if the belt passes that threshold, so it's an event, then they change it. Uh, so here they're trying to forecast when any point on this growing curve will cross say 15 millimeters because beyond that point, it's too likely that the belt will be damaged or the carcass will get damaged by the ore. So how do they do that? Um, this is a paper out of UWA that probably reflects the best practice in industry. Uh, so their analysis is usually done on uh, the throughput. So amount of tons across the conveyor belt. Uh, and this is because it's sort of a proxy for utilization. So rather than using calendar time, they use um, throughput, which is what we do as well. Uh, and then they pretty much do a linear regression for every one of their N measurement locations across the width of the belt. Uh, and then they take the steepest slope and they extrapolate that to when it will hit the uh, soft failure threshold. Uh, and as you may be thinking, when you look at this, like it's a, it's oversensitive to outliers, especially when you don't have a lot of data. So early on in the conveyor belt life, uh, we're also don't have any uncertainty quantification. Um, and there is a whole belt here, but we're summarizing it by one point. Uh, and another problem that does arise is that very often um, engineers or technicians will change the inspection routine like halfway through a belt life. So the measurement locations will change. Um, and in this case, it's hard to incorporate that. Uh, so we hope to kind of fix this. Uh, so a better analysis should uh, incorporate the spatial information about the wear behavior of that belt. Uh, it should also properly account for all the sources of uncertainty. Um, so we have the uncertainty in the measurements, the uncertainty in the degradation process, and also the parameters of that degradation process. Uh, and there is another one, which I'll talk about the, at the end, uh, but in this model, we don't account for it yet. Uh, and then it should be able to produce an interpretable forecast that the engineer can look at and use to make decisions and then defend these decisions to planners and other people. So uh, to do this, we use a Bayesian hierarchical model um, and these are commonly used in spatial statistics or spatiotemporal stats. Um, and so rather than defining a big complicated likelihood function, we break uh, this up into a set of conditional models. Uh, where on the first level of the hierarchy, we have the data model, uh, which models the observation process. And then uh, the second level is the process model, uh, which in this case is modeling the underlying degradation of the belt. Uh, and then finally, you have the parameter model, uh, which for this case is just the priors. But if you have, say, uh, random effects or other things, that's where these models for the parameters come in. Uh, and I'm going to go through our model. Uh, with by each of these submodels. Uh, so I'll go through the data model first and the process and the parameters. Uh, so to start with, for the data model, we take a functional data analysis uh, methodology. So that's to say that we perceive the data. Uh, so we assume that the data comes from a smooth underlying latent function uh, and we're getting noisy observations of that function at discrete, discrete locations. Uh, and you can see this from thinking about the problem uh, logic, like from a practical point of view, it kind of makes sense with belt wear because uh, we can make a fair assumption that the wear profile of the belt is smooth. And then we're taking ultrasonic thickness measurements at different locations and those thickness measurements will have some amount of noise. Um, so here we have some smooth underlying function FI with some measurement error defined by uh, Sigma. The question now is, well, what do we, what's the functional form that we assign to FI? Uh, so we use a B spline to do this. Um, so we fix the set of knots. Uh, so that means we're conditioning on this set of basis functions that you can see down the bottom. Uh, so the function is the weighted sum of these different basis functions. So the smooth profile of the belt at each time point can be described by the set of spline coefficients, so the YIMs. Uh, so M is, is 10 in this case, because we have 10 basis functions. So we get kind of a vector of 10 uh, coefficients at each time point that fully describes the profile of the belt. And this is what it looks like when you just fit the splines. Uh, so we can kind of see this smooth underlying profile and we see the bump gradually growing over time. And so now we want to forecast when this random function will cross the line, uh, the soft failure threshold. 
So if we now go to the process model, uh, we're concerned about modeling the coefficients of the spline. Um, so this, and this is what we can see here. So we can see the evolution of the coefficients. So red corresponds to the right side of the belt and blue to the left. Uh, and then the yellowy green are in the center of the belt. So kind of analogous to what we saw on the previous page, the center of the belt is wearing more than the edges. Uh, and what we also see is that the degradation is not exactly constant, like constant. So we have some heterogeneity in the wear rate. Um, and so because of this, we use a gamma process. Uh, it's a type of stochastic process that's fairly well uh, used in the reliability literature for modeling monotonic increasing wear. Um, so a gamma process pretty much, uh, you're assuming that the jumps in degradation, so um, in this case, yi and yi minus one, um, are independent and come from a gamma distribution uh, where the shape parameter depends on some shape function eta and the time step uh, and the rate is uh, some rate psi. Uh, and here for the shape function, we use a linear shape function uh, because as you could see on the previous slide, the wear jumps around, but it kind of looks linear in general. Um, and you can use other, uh, other forms, but most of the time you can do some kind of transformation to make the data look linear in this way. Um, but we also make a slight reparameterization of the gamma process. Uh, so we define it in terms of mu, which is the mean wear rate per unit time and the coefficient of variation. Uh, and these two parameters, they're orthogonal. Uh, so that gives us kind of a additional interpretability to the model and also it's computationally convenient. Uh, it's interpretable because each of these parameters now control a different aspect of the model. Uh, so the mean wear rate mu kind of controls the general slope of the overall degradation process, uh, whereas the coefficient of variation is how different each of the jumps can be. Uh, so this makes eliciting information and interpreting results a lot easier. Um, and because uh, there's no kind of covariance between these two parameters, uh, it makes sampling a lot easier as well. Uh, so down the bottom here, you can see the gamma process reparameterized in this way uh, and simplified. So delta y is just the difference uh, the jumps in degradation and the delta t's are the time steps. Uh, but this is just a single gamma process. Um, obviously, we have 10 spline coefficients. Uh, so what we do is we model each of them with a gamma process where each spline coefficient has its own uh, average wear rate. Um, and then we completely pull the coefficient of variation. So it's shared amongst all the different uh, spline coefficients. And then the final layer is the uh, parameter model, which is just our priors. Uh, so on the standard deviation of the noise, sigma, uh, we just use a uniform prior defined between zero and A, where A is large. Um, and this, we choose this prior, uh, like it's a relatively non-informative prior. Uh, and the reason this is okay in this case is because we have a lot of information in the data about the measurement error. So we've got about eight functional observations. Uh, and then for each of those, functions, they're realized at 20 different points. Uh, so there's quite a lot of data informing sigma. But then as we go down the uh, down levels in the hierarchy, we need more um, kind of informative priors. So on the mean wear rates of the different coefficients, we place a normal distribution uh, with mean, that, uh, mean and standard deviation that we specify. Uh, and so this can come from either domain expert knowledge of an engineer or from a previous belt life or you could take like an empirical Bayesian approach and estimate it from the data. Um, so we set the, these hyperparameters A, M and B, M ourself. Uh, and then for the coefficient of variation, we use a half Cauchy uh, because there's a lot less information informing this um, parameter. So, and a half Cauchy is fairly well behaved when that's the case. Um, and we also know that it's defined between zero and infinity, but we expect it to be uh, kind of closer to zero. Uh, and we set the scale to be 25 so that it's only weakly informative on the parameter. So the model all up uh, here at the top, we have the functional data model, uh, and then we have the process model, which is a gamma process, uh, and then we have our priors down the bottom. So now we take this model and we fit it in STAN. Uh, so STAN is a um, 
probabilistic programming language that uses a dynamic version of um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo in its backend. Um, and Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is a convenient MCMC sampler because it's based on the geometry of the target distribution. And so we get a lot of, uh, along with it being efficient uh, in most cases, we also get a nice set of diagnostic tools uh, that tell us if the post, uh, if the posterior is difficult to explore. And uh, these are kind of warnings and help you to diagnose issues that might not necessarily be diagnosed if you use an, um, some other MCMC sampler. Uh, like, yeah. So after we're implementing it in STAN, we get samples from the posterior distribution. Uh, so here you can see the posterior predictive distribution, um, which is pretty much the filtered curves uh, based on the model. Um, and so we can see it's done a fairly good job at this point uh, at modeling the actual data that we've observed. Uh, most of the UT measurements fall within the uncertainty bounds. We can see that slowing uh, growth of the curve, but obviously we're not particularly concerned with uh, the historic, we want to forecast. So the really valuable thing in the posterior distribution is the posteriors of the parameters. Uh, so we've got the posterior of the standard deviation, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, of the standard deviation of the noise. Uh, and then we have the joint uh, distribution of the coefficient of variation and the mean wear rates for each of the coefficients. Uh, and so then we can take this and we can produce forecasts. Uh, so we can produce a forecast uh, here. I say week 24, so 10 weeks from the most recent, but obviously that's based on planned production. So Delta T, the time horizon is actually still in tons. Uh, so we specify some time horizon uh, and then we use the posteriors of the, co of the parameters uh, and we sample jumps in degradation uh, from a gamma distribution for each of the coefficients. And then we add this to the most recently observed uh, kind of filtered surface uh, and then we pass it back through the functional data layer onto the measurement locations and we can produce kind of the prediction uh, well, we can produce a prediction of the curve at that time at each of those locations uh, and that's what we can see down the bottom here so the black line is the median uh, predicted curve and then the blue bands are uh, the uncertainty intervals on that prediction uh, once again the dashed line is the soft failure threshold uh, and then these black lines are the actual true measurements at this time that we withheld during the model fitting. Uh, so we can see even with like quite a large forecast horizon, about 10 weeks, um, we have a reasonably, the model's done a reasonable uh, job at predicting this particular degradation jump. Um, but we do have this long, because we're using a gamma distribution, we have quite a long tail up here. Uh, now, obviously an engineer is not gonna have the true measurements. Uh, so how would an engineer actually use this? Well, they may have a shutdown coming up in week 18 and another one in week 20. And so based on plant production rates, they can predict what the wear will look like at those two dates. Uh, and then they can see, okay, well, these are my two predictions. We can see that, oh yeah, maybe by week 18, the belt will have failed, but it's probably most likely going to have failed by week 24. Uh, and then if they need further justification on specific locations on the belt, they can kind of uh, take, they can take a cross section of that um, forecast and work out what's the actual probability of that point crossing the line by that date. So say we wanted to use uh, at point N equals 10, uh, we wanna work out what's the probability that the belt will have failed by that time. Uh, so we can go here. Uh, we can take a cross section and then we can calculate the mass that sits above that threshold. Uh, so here we can see that the probability is about 0.38 that the belt will have failed by week 24. Um, so that's how an engineer would use it. Uh, and, but there is a few spots where the model is lacking, where we'd like to improve it. Um, so before I said there's one level that we haven't accounted for, uh, one level of uncertainty. Uh, and you may have noticed when I was saying how they collected the data, I said they stopped the belt and then they start it again. Uh, so they stop the belt and they just take one set of measurements. Uh, so they don't take repeated measurements at each time. So there's the unaccounted for spatial variability along the length of the belt. Um, and engineers have told us that that's not that great because it's just cycling around. So the variability along the length of the belt is not as substantial as across the belt, uh, but it would also be, it would be nice to include that. 
Um, and we do have nowadays, there's a lot of startups that are improving the monitoring. So they'll either have like laser measurements of the thickness or there's computer vision software to measure the thickness at the head pulley. Uh, so it would be nice to have a bit more granular data that we could include that particular um, level of uncertainty in this model. Uh, but at the moment, it's not really possible. And then one other thing is, um, so we, the only way we're reusing prior information at this case is setting the, um, the priors for the average, slot, uh, average wear rate for each coefficient. But after we fit this model to a previous belt life, we have a lot of information about the general behavior of that belt. So we have kind of like the overall wear profile and how that's growing. Um, and when lacking, utilizing that in a new prediction. So if we could use, a, uh, if we could incorporate greater prior knowledge, then we could improve predictions early on in life when there's only one or two measurements. Uh, and this would help with like long range planning. And then this kind of ties into that. Uh, so at the moment, if we produce kind of imaginary belts from the parameters, uh, from the posterior of the parameters, there's no spatial relationship between neighboring spline coefficients, um, where we would kind of expect that areas of the belt that are close to each other are uh, more closely behaved. Uh, so when we generate data, we kind of see this really rough uh, kind of humps, uh, but we would kind of expect a more smoother profile. Uh, so in the future, uh, currently I'm working on it, is including a random, a spatial random effect, maybe using like a conditional order regressive prior of some kind. Um, yeah, but that's it. Thank you. Any questions?